Welcome to Svarim Vesayfrim. This is, I, I'm going to call it the first shear, the first lesson. Uh, we'll review a little from the other one. The, the last class that we had was more of an introduction. And um, so just as a synopsis, what we will be speaking about today, and it's possible, it's possible that um, we're not going to finish it today. But today's Yud Beis Eir, and uh, it's a couple days before Pesach Sheni. The first section of it is a Devarim Shabal Peh Iyata Rishoy La'imran Biksav. Things, you have the Torah Shabal Peh and you have the Torah Shabiksav. The Torah Shabiksav, you cannot say Bal Peh. The Torah Shabal Peh, you cannot write it down. This is the first topic that we'll be talking about. And we did mention it last time, but we will review. Uh, in Mir Tzachem, there will be many, many shiurim. And some of these topics are going to the people that we're going to talk about, the, the, the giants that we're going to be speaking about, the G'dayli Yisrael, the Rishonim, the Achreinim. Today, we're going to talk a little about the Ga'inim. So this is something that will continue uh, in Mir Tzachem. And it's also something that I've developed throughout the years and based on different svarim that I saw, uh, based on, uh, on, you could say, my mentor, who, who we, we were working on the Sefer, Hamavi Lucifer Rambam. So he had many, many discussions about this. So there's one particular theme, and that is the difference between Sfard and Ashkenaz. This is a, a Barilan. So I was using that last time, uh, the Barilan. And that's one way that you could be searching many, many different things. Let's say you want to search, as we said before, Devarim Shabiksav. So I'm searching all databases. And I'm not searching for the exact words. So let's see what comes up. And the first thing comes up, Gitin Daf Samach. Ahmed Bays. So here's one tool that I have that in this Barilan you could al- always um, right click and you could see all the different Mepharshim and the Mir Tzashem will be talking about many of these different Mepharshim. You could select all Rishinim, just the Rishinim, and you could bring up over here what they say on it. You have Rashi and as you scroll down you see the other Mefarshim like Chidushe Arashba, Chidushe Haritva. So this is a, actually a wonderful, wonderful tool. So when I was doing this just before preparing for the shear, I was thinking, well, I have so many different links. So what's the best way to go about it? So I brought this in, in into Google Docs and you click over here and it takes you to this so while I'm giving this year, I will have an outline of what we'll be talking about. And very simply, I'll be able to bring up the different links that I have here. So when I was doing that, it reminded me of something so interesting. And we call this, let's say I'm going to bring this up right now. So we all know we're in the 21st century. We know that this is called the internet. This is the internet. This is World Wide Web, WWW. The truth of the matter is, if we think about it, or we look into it, we could see that actually the time that, uh, that we're spending most of our day learning Taira, a major chunk of that is learning Mishnah and learning Gemara. Now, Gemara itself is divided into different tractates. And what's a tractate? The section, a book. There, we say that there are 60 shishi mesechtas. One meseches, or we call it mesechta in Aramaic, is one tractate. But where is that word from? So I'm going to click over here onto Wikipedia. Meseches, and I knew this before, I didn't need Wikipedia for that, but it's so interesting that the Shairish Hamila, we could call it um, what is the source of the word, uh, the Shairish Hamila 
So we see from a Pasik that talks about somebody who weaves threads. Vayemer Allah, there's a Pasik in Shaiftim. There's a Pasik in Shaiftim Perikta Zayim Pasik in Gimel. Vayemer Allah, Im Targiya Sheva Machlofa Yisraishi, Im HaMaseches. So basically what a Maseches is like a web, like someone who is combining, combining things together. Think of it like a spider web. A spider web, I don't have to bring up a picture of a spider web, but it has lines and it goes from one place to another place to another place. And that's what the web is, somebody who is weaving something. There are many, many threads attaching. And what happens? So what is a Maseches? A Maseches is that book, that Sefer, that Gemara, that has in itself many, many different words. But think about the Gemara. Ah, oh, what happens during the Gemara when you're learning a Daf Gemara? What happens? It happens is somebody mentions one thing, and Amira mentions one thing. That takes you on a tangent to another thing, which takes you to another thing, which takes you to another thing. That's exactly what Gemara is all about. It's the discussion. It's the elaboration of Tyre Shabal Peh. That's called Tyre, of Tyre Shabik Sav. It's called Tyre, Tyre Shabal Peh. I don't know. How does this line get over here? And how do we get rid of it? I have no idea. I didn't do that. Hopefully it could, could go away. No. Oh, there we go. Of Tyre of Tyre Shabal Peh. So this is what a this is what a Maseches is. This is what Gemara is. Gemara is the web, the holy web, where idea you so to say click on it. The Amaraim didn't need any clicks; they had it in their head, and they would go from one thing to another. So that's by the way with Maseches. Now we're going to start our first topic over here. I thought I did know Zoom well, but obviously I don't. I was thinking if I could see the chats, and I do not do not see any any of the chats. I don't really know how that works. So if you once again, if you have any questions, you could um, you could let me know. You could let me know by email. Okay. So we're, now we're going to start our first our first topic over here. The Gemara says, "Dvarm Shabal Peh." Things which are oral, you're not allowed to write down. This is something which is biksav. What is ksav? Think to yourself, this is mikra. This is the Torah. The words of the Torah, you cannot, excuse me. Dvarm shabiksav That's the things of the Torah you can't say by heart. And the flip side of it, Dvarm Shabal Peh, if something is Baal Peh, in other words, Maishar Rabbeinu went up to, Ma- to Har Sinai, and there he was taught all about the 613 mitzvahs. Let's say one of the mitzvahs is Tfilin. So what does it say in the Pasuk? So what do we know from that? We don't know much. We have absolutely no clue what that means. How does that, how does that merge how does that become the tefillin that we're wearing today? So the answer is, that's Teresh Baal Peh. This is what Hashem told Moshe Baal Peh orally. And then there was another thing, and that is, he must tell that orally to the next generation. That's what we start with Pirkei Avis. Moshe Kibol Teresh Misina, Yom Yeshua, and Yeshua Liz Kanim. And it keeps on going from one generation to generation. Do not write it down. Dvarim Shabal Peh, you're not allowed to write it down. So this is what happened. As we spoke about last time, and I'm going to go through it briefly, the problem with that, of course, is that it's like the game I mentioned last time. It's like the game of telephone. You start off with one thing, and by the time the fifth person gets to it, it's completely different. It changes. So as generations progressed, and they were further away from the Messiah for Moshe Rabbeinu, so then started to be different uh, different opinions. And it came to such a situation that they said, you know what, if this is the case, if this is the case, then Ace Lasis Lashem, Hefeiro Tarasecha. 
we have to, and I'm looking over here for, I'm looking here for my Barilan. Hopefully I can find it, yeah. Eis lasis lashem, hefeiru teresecha. Let's say, eis lasis. Eis lasis lashem is a pasuk in Tehillim per kufiotes. So uh, it came along Rabbi Yehuda HaNasi, and he says, if that's the case, we're going to completely forget about Torah. So therefore, Rabbi Yehuda HaNasi, he compiled the Mishnah. Otherwise, people will forget the Torah completely. Okay, so what happened was that Yehud, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi wrote it down and compiled it in the Mishnah. But before we get to that, we all know what the Mishnah is. I'm going to ask you a question. Let me be like a teacher. Think to yourself. What is the reason why it was so important that Dvarim Shabbat you should not write it down? There's so much information there. You're talking about Taryag Mitzvahs. Just think to yourself, you have the Mishnah Torah of the Rambam is in 14 Halakim, and that's only the Halacha part of it. How is it possible for a person to remember everything? Why is it so important not to, not to write it down? And this is key. In order to understand this, think about it a little. I would ask for <laughs> different remarks, but I want you to think about it. And I'll begin talking about at least my ideas that I had. Some of it perhaps I heard from other people, but this is an essential question. For what reason, Devarm Shabal Pe, Yatarashai Laimran, Big Sav? Why can't you write it down? So here comes when actually will be related to the second part of the shear whether today or not, the difference between Smart and Ashkenaz and the whole Hashkafa. So let me begin by saying that if a person wants to collect Svarim, we have plenty of Svarim nowadays. There's every, every week comes out, who knows, a hundred new Svarim. But if a person wants to collect Svarim, a very good idea that the person should do is go to families where somebody passes away. And the best thing is somebody, a family that is not really, um, not at this point religious, but they have a father, perhaps they have a grandfather or a great grandfather. And it was given down from one generation to the next generation, these holy books. And people don't even know that they exist. Let me give you an example. Uh, at a different chair, I'll talk more about it. But there are certain svarim that were disappeared from Klal Yisrael. Many svarim disappeared. Perhaps you could say from before the time of the, of the printing press, Perhaps you could say that most of the Svarim disappeared. When we say Aksav Yad, it doesn't mean that it was written by the author. Aksav Yad means that it was copied before the printing press. Let's say the printing press uh, came about in the late 1400s. And uh, before that, people would, would, would copy Svarim. There's, as I said, certain Svarim disappeared, especially, I don't have a link for it now, especially from, let's see if we could do this, especially from Provence. Provence, uh, France. Provence, France. So here are images, let's go back one. Uh, Wikipedia is best, okay. Provence uh, uh, is Southern, Southern France. There are a lot of G'dayli Yisrael that lived in Provence, in southern France. Uh, amongst them, the Ravid and Rabbi Yainis and Milunil, Rabbi Zrachia Halevi, perhaps these names are known to you. And it was a very, this was the place, this was the Makam Torah. Actually, the Rambam wrote to Rabbi Yainis and Akayim Milunil. He says, Torah basically is gone, if not for, for you and your students 
in Lunil. That's what the Rambam wrote. Anyways, another person who lived there was Rabbi Menachem, Rabbeinu Menachem, Menachem HaMeiri. Rabbeinu Menachem HaMeiri lived to our readers over there. Okay, let's see if it's going to come up here. Okay, Rabbeinu Menachem ben Shlomo Mishpachas HaMeiri. He lived in the 1200s. He wrote, Beis HaBchira, the Svarim that he wrote were lost, basically. We had a Sefer here, a Sefer there. This is on, on Shas. And the Me'iri, we'll talk about him at a different time, but the Me'iri takes a person by the hand, more so than Rashi, we could say. And he's like your partner teacher who teaches you in such a beautiful language, the Gemara. The problem is that... Um, that they were lost until Hamea Asrim, until the 20th century. There's a whole story about how they found it, but I'll tell you, Bikitzer, they found it in somebody's attic. That's where they found the whole set. That's one copy, one manuscript of the Me'iri was found in somebody's attic. And it was all dusty and everything. That's how we have the Meiri today. If we had the Meiri from the time that he wrote it until today, we'd be even a lot more popular. But Pasha, we did not have it. We did not have access to it. So what am I saying? Let me go back to original original statement. And that is that Dvarm Shabal Peya to Why is it important? If a person wants to collect Svarim, go to those people who are not interested in Svarim, yet they have Svarim from their parents, from their grandparents and great-grandparents. You go over to them and you say, could I please have your holy books, your Jewish books? And they'll say, why, of course. Take it off. It's taking up too much space. You have no idea what treasures you could find over there. We're not talking about monetary, but it also could be worth a lot of money. But besides for that, kisveyad, manuscripts that you could have there. So why are they giving it up? The answer is, that's the difference between Taira Shabal Peh and Taira Shabik Sav. If you only have something which is written, you there is a big, big danger to that. How many times you go into people's houses and they have bias mali svarim, full of svarim, but they're all new. Why are they all new? They're not used. Why aren't they used? Because it's it's there on the bookshelf. If they ever want it, they could take a look at it. They could see it. So there you go. It's the difference between static and dynamic. Static means these people, whatever their names are, they have from their Zaydis forum over there. It's static. It's on the bookshelf. It's in the attic over there. It's not moving. There's no reason. However, when the Chazal said, you cannot write it down, they meant nothing could be static. If you wanted to give it to the next generation, you can't give it to them as a book. You have to speak to them. You have to have a relationship with them. You have to constantly review the material because if you don't review the material, you're going to forget it. So it's a constant pressure for you, but that pressure is good. The pressure is good because that guarantees the success of the future generations that they're also going to. They can't, I don't know if they're able to study everything, to, to know everything by heart, but the, at least the things that are negated to them, they have to constantly review and give it over to the next generation. So there we have a couple ideas. Number one, hopefully I could print in English, static versus dynamic. That's number one. Number two, number two, it could be also the difference between between the highest that you have, enthusiasm. How can you be, how can you be enthusiastic? How, 
How can you learn how to spell right? Nowadays, you don't need to. No, that's not my question. How could you be enthusiastic about, about a book? You could be excited about a book and I don't know how long the excitement is gonna last and I don't know how long we're, our attention spans are, but if it's just something that's written, it lacks the enthusiasm involved in, there, in that also. So that's another point. The other point is the Messiah. The Messiah. The Messiah is the tradition. That means, think of it, Moshe Rabbeinu is the 100% Messiah. He's the beginning of the Messiah. And then it goes to the next generation and to the next generation. So if it's only written down in a book, there's, there's really no, no connection to the Messiah. It's written. It's written, whatever is written over there. If you have that chain, the chain could be with people, not with books. The chain has to continue. When Moshe Rabbeinu gave it over to Aaron, who then gave it over to the next generation, or Yeshua, and to the next generation, the way that he said that Moshe Rabbeinu said it, you can't write that in the book. You don't even have exclamation marks in Torah in the in the Mikra. You don't have question marks over there. You don't have symbols. You don't have emojis as far as I know. I don't know. We don't have tons of things over there. So, so how do you know that's called, I think, the, inflic the inflection or something like that? You don't have that. However, you could always remember, ah, oh, this is the way that my teacher, that my teacher presented something. I recall I learned in Morristown and Harav Melech Tzvibel, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, was the Mashpia. And all of a sudden, one time, he, he said he's going to have a special Fabrengen, and the Fabrengen is going to teach a particular Sicha that just came out. And we also know that Remelech Tzvibel was one of the people who was involved in actually editing the Sichas for the Rebbe. There were uh, different people who were doing that. So remember that time that there was a special for Brangen, and he talked about that Sicha, and it was like, it was like receiving it, Tayr Shabal Peh, Mi Piagvura. It was unbelievable. Why? Because he showed us the importance of that and pointed out something which was, you could say, like a game changer, that Sicha. What would be if I got the Sicha in the mail? And I looked at it, and I'm enthusiastic, whatever, or I don't understand all the nuances of it. That's because it's only Big Sav. It's missing the Balpe. It's missing the Mesaira. It's missing the enthusiasm. It's missing that chain. And the further you go away from the chain, then you could say the more danger there is. So of, of, of breaking that, of breaking that chain or not having that. So that, by the way, Bederach Agav is the differences between, we say that uh, Amoira doesn't argue on a Tana in general, in general. We, and Amoira doesn't argue with the Tana. The Tana is closer to the Moshe Rabbeinu. The Tana is more closer to the original. So that is, that is the idea of Dvarim Shabal Peh. So, however, with all these advantages, with all these advantages, there is also the disadvantage. And Chazal had to make that decision. And they said, it's wonderful, Tarish Shabal Peh. It's great. It's phenomenal. However, let's be realistic. If it's going to continue like this, we're at a stage so many years later, after 2,448, we're a couple thousand years after, after that. I don't know exactly the time frame. Uh, so we have a question. We have a danger that basically we're going to forget everything. If we forget everything, there goes Judaism. We have to con continue it. So therefore, they said, However, not so fast. Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi was the one 
who compiled the Mishnah. We mentioned before Harav Ruvein Margolius, a tremendous Talmud Chacham. And what's, what I like about Wikipedia is that you have external links. So you could see over here um, different svarim that he wrote, different articles that he wrote. And one of these svarim, actually, I'm looking at this now, Shailu Suchuvas Mina Shemaim, we'll talk about it in a different lesson, but he wrote a tremendous ha ha uh, hakdama introduction to Shailu Suchuvas Mina Shemaim, saying, um, Hakwi Paskin, there was this one of this Baal Taisvis, and basically, he asked a question and went to sleep. He woke up in the morning, he got his answer. And uh, so he wrote a tremendous haktamas to Muhammad Hashem of Rabbeinu Avram ben Arambam. But the sefer that he wrote, um, look at all these different svarim, is, um, I don't see it over here. Now it, here I see it. And you can get it in Hebrew books. And that's Yisaita Mishnah Varichasa. So you go in Hebrew books and you could, oh, that's the link to Hebrew books. We don't want that. So anyways, here we have the link in Hebrew books. You cite our Mishnah of Arichasa. So here's another amazing, amazing website that you should use and hebrewbooks.org. I met the person who put this all together. Incredible work that he did. And you should know that thousands upon thousands of svarim are taken from the Rebbe's library. A lot of them is a stamp, Oyo Yosef Yitzchak Lubavitch. And um, he, it's put up over here. You could download the whole Sefer. The Sefer, this safe, particular Sefer is not very long. You could download it or you could read it online. Here you have the different pages. You go to the different pages. You could make it also um, smaller. So you don't really need for this Aitzer HaChachma. But here in his Hakdama, he talks about this whole idea of the Mishnah going back here. And you say that Mishnah Varichas, he speaks, well, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi came along and that was the danger, so he said, okay, I'm going to put together the Mishnah, but not so fast, not so fast. You can't write down, you can't get rid of this Dvarim Shabal Peh, you can't get rid of it so fast. You have to continue the Messira. Let me give you another example. Example is where something broke off the Messira. There's something that we know that's called Kabbalah. Okay, Hasidus is based on Kabbalah. So we're not going to talk about it, but you heard about Kabbalah. You heard about the Zayar. You heard about all the different Kabbalah Sfarim. Why is it called Kabbalah? It's called Kabbalah simply because Kabbalah means receiving from one generation to the next. It's something for Yechide Skula, for special people. It's not for everybody. Therefore, the Kabbalah was not accessible to everybody on purpose. You had to have the Kabbalah. You had to have a Rebbe. And it's very dangerous to learn Kabbalah if you don't have the proper, so to say, Messiah. So long comes, so let's say Kabbalah, Reb Shimon Bar Yechai wrote the Zayar. Um, just that you should know that Rabbi Yaakov Emden wrote in his Sefer, well, not everything Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai wrote. The Zayar that we have, we also have from later dates also something else. Rabbi Yaakov Emden, we'll speak about him at different time. So the Arizal came along, and the Arizal came along in the, in the 15th, in the 16th century, uh, Rabbi Yitzchik Luria in the 16th century. And he says, and he says, mitzvah legalis, mitzvah legalis zois ha He's buried in Tzvas, over here. You have the Ramak was his Rebbe. Shleima Alkovitz was the Beis Yosef's brother-in-law. Here you have the picture of the, of the Arizal. So he says, Mitzvah At that time, he changed. And just like perhaps we could compare it to, I don't know if you can compare exactly, but 
The same thing Rabbi Yehuda Nasi did with the Mishnah, the Varm Shabal Peyat Tershay Lomer Bixav, Eis Lasis Hashem. The same thing that Arizal did because he saw that there was a need for it, the necessity for that. Comes along, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi did the Mishnah, but the Mishnah is very cryptic. That means it's like a mystery when you're learning the Mishnah. Not everything is a hundred percent clear. So. What he did, what he did was he wrote it as if, and we spoke about last time also, he didn't write everything that's necessary. When you start off the Mishnah, when you start off the Mishnah, then you have Me'emes Aikar and Shema Ba'arvis. He's not telling you what the Shema is all about. He's just telling you about these different points that you got to know. He's not going to tell you everything. They were written in a way like notes. Notes is if you if you're listening to a share from somebody if you're listening to a lesson and you're writing notes, you look at the note and you wrote bekitzer you wrote very briefly you take a look at these couple words and you know what's the whole thing talking about, that's notes. If you give that that those notes to somebody else they'll have no clue. That's what Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi wanted to do. What Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi wanted to do was to write the Mishnah in a way like notes, just taking notes. So you look at the notes and it will remind you about everything that you, you the Torah Shabbat Peh that you heard from beforehand. But he, Dafke did not want to write it so clear. Therefore, we have many times Chisure Maxera. We have 785 occurrences throughout the Gemara. Chisure Maxera, it's missing a couple words. Vahachiktani. So if Chisura Mechser of Ahachiktani, why didn't they learn it? Why wasn't he clear? Ah, the answer is he wasn't clear on purpose. I don't know if this is the Chiddush of Rabbi Margolius or he took it from somebody else or other people who wrote about the mission beforehand. Okay, so that is that generation. We didn't do a complete breakthrough in Dvarim Shabal Peh, Yatar Rishayla Oymran Biksav. It was not a complete breakthrough. It was just notes. As time progressed, we're soon going to get to, to a couple other interesting things, but as time progressed, just like from Moshe Rabbeinu, the Torah Shabbat Pest started with Moshe Rabbeinu, and it was great the first few generations, and then as time, as, as, as time progress, progressed, things got out of hand. The same thing also with the Mishnah that no longer were they able to look at the notes of the Mishnah and understand. That's why he had many discussions. What's the discussions? The discussions of the Gemara. What is Gemara, basically? Gemara is a base medrash in a certain area in Bavel for the Talmud Bavli or in Eretz Yisrael. I think it's Tiveria for Talmud Yerushalmi. I don't think Talmud Yerushalmi has anything to do with Yerushalayim, if I'm not mistaken. If I am, let me know. But it was basically in, in, in the northern region of Eretz Yisrael, Talmud Yerushalmi, basically discussion groups. So you have a breakout group of discussion. And they're talking about, hey, what does it say in the Mishnah? What does it mean over here? What is that? And finally, they came along, Ravina and Ravashi, after several generations, let's say the year around 500, and they said, Adkan, let's write down all these discussions. What are the discussions of the Torah Shabbat Peh? I think Mishnah, Mishnah, by the way, is more of a stress to learn the words of the Mishnah, Baal Peh. Not so much Gemara. I'm not saying not. There are, plenty, there are people who know the whole Gemara, Baal Peh. It's because they have a phenomenal memory. But actually to learn Mishnah, Baal Peh, Mishnah is Baal Peh is a big thing. Perhaps you could say, I don't know if I heard it from anybody, Perhaps you could say that's because Mishnah has more of a connection to the Torah Shabal Peh. And it's the words also. It's like a blend of Torah Shabal Sav and Torah Shabal Peh. The words are important. Saying it Baal Peh are important. Okay, I digress. And that's what I do. It's Meseches. You go from one thing to the next. That's why I had to write the notes over here. So we're going to continue with this. The idea is... Baal Peh did not stop, even after the Gemara. But before that, let's talk about this idea of Baal Peh. So we said 
the ideas of the Mishnah beforehand, halachas, but it's not only, it's not only uh, halacha that we're talking about. And I don't want to forget, by the way, that this, I'm just going to highlight it here that you should know, this could we actually, I wonder, could we go in the text and we could highlight, highlight the text color, no? That's the text, highlight, forget about that. Oh, highlight this. Okay, good. We're learning. We learned yet to, um, Google Docs. Okay, this is like the shiurim from uh, Rabbi Mentlik. He taught he taught us Microsoft Word and Google Docs. Anyways, don't mind my sense of humor. St this static versus dynamic, static versus dynamic, is going to be very very important for the next step, which is between Svard, between Svard and Ashkenaz. Okay, so just don't want to forget that. Let us continue now, and it seems uh, that we'll continue through here, and maybe Shir Gimel, the next, the, next, the next Shir will be between Svard and Ashkenaz. I won't review this, what we're doing right now. So let us continue over here. The Seder, when we're talking about pe, we're talking about pe. So let's think about it. I'll show you something very interesting. We have simone haseder. So what's the simonim of the seder? Kadei shorchatz, and we could sing it. Kadei shorchatz, kapas yachatz. All different tunes and everything. Do we ever think about what's behind the words of the seder, and why is it called seder? So the answer seems to me simple. And that is sometimes we get into pshetlach and we forget about the simple explanation. So uh, let me tell you a pshetl right now. I'll tell you this. And that is, and it's written in Tsair Lateva, brought down in Tsair Lateva from the Vart of the Malakit over there. And the Vart is what is Seder. We know that there are four parts to the Torah. Four parts to the Torah. There is Shat, Shat, Remez, Gush, and Said. Uh, ignore all. Okay. Shat, Remez, Drush, and Said. The simple explanation, the hint, the, the darshaning exegesis, whatever you call it. I don't even know if I'm allowed to say that, that word on, on uh, Zoom over here. And side, the hidden part. So if you look at this, that's part of this. So the question is, I'm telling you the, the pshetl. So the question is, what's the difference between Pesach and the whole year? The whole year that you have the Mitzvah, you have to remember every day going out of Mitzrayim. So what's the difference between the two? What's what comes along Manishtana? What comes along on Pesach that is different? And we know that in the Rebbe's Haggadah, he talks about it, has five answers to it. So basically the idea is the Gansi Yar the whole year is Pshat. However, on Pesach, we focus on the Remez Drush and Said. So take a look at that. Samach Dalad Resh. Seder, and that's what Seder is. That is the Vart, but that's not really the Pshat. Okay? So that's why we call it, that's why we call Seder, because we're not focusing so much on the Pshat. If you want to know the Pshat, the simple thing of what happened on, uh, on Pesach or before Pesach, you read out of Egypt, and you have that a whole year. Just joking. But if you want to have the deeper part, that's the Seder. However, what's the real explanation? It seems that the simple explanation, going back to Tere Shabal Peh, when the Seder started, whoever composed the Seder, you didn't have a Haggadah like we have. It's all part of the, it's all part of the, of the Tere Shabal Peh. They had to remember, they had to remember what to do 
because they didn't have it written down. So they made like the Mishnah, they made the notes. And the notes are, start with Kaddish, then you go to Urchatz. The Pasha didn't have a Haggadah. I see over here he writes, but Kufus HaRishayim, Kufus Simanim Shayim, Haggadah Shal, Shal Pesach. So I'm wondering if it's only, if it's Kufus HaRishayim or if it's be, beforehand. Maybe I'm wrong in what I'm saying, but it seems that even if they, I'm, I'm not so sure that this is correct, that that's when they wrote, they were Mechaber, the Simanim. What I'm saying is that it was always like that. And the Torah Shabal Peh that they had, they didn't really have the Haggadah Shal Pesach written because Dvarim Shabal Peh, you're not allowed to eat to Rishay Lohem and Biksav, including the Haggadah Shal Pesach. It could be I'm wrong. Info at shazak.com. Let me know if I'm wrong. Shgi Yismini Yavin. We spoke about last time that, uh, you know what? You make a lot of mistakes. That's all part of the process. You have Lamites Malachis on Shabbos, and you have Ksiva, but also Mechika, Moichik, to erase things is also a Malacha. It's all part of the process. So it could be I'm mistaken. Anyways, so that's the Seder Shal Pesach, Dvarim Shabal Peh. I'll give you another thing. Siddur Tfila. Where does the word Siddur come along? How, how do we get the word Siddur? And the answer is that, let's go over here. Siddur originally was, let's see if it's Hebrew or English. Okay, this one is in English. Siddur is originally from the Ga'inim. Now, we'll talk a little more about the, the Ga'inim in the next year. And in a nutshell, the Ga'inim lived in Bavel. There were two Talmudical academies. There was Sura and there was Pumpadisa. Rav Amram Ga'in, so basically you had, you had these two yeshivas, Yarche Kala, they came during the months of Adar for one month and the month of Elul beforehand, and they studied over there. Questions were asked by the Rosh, Hashiv, Rosh Mesifta, and you also had a Reish Galusa. Reish Galusa was more the politician. He had to deal with the government, with taxes, and collect taxes, and to work with the government, and to, and to provide sustenance to the yeshiva. So he was more the political figure. So anyways, Rav Amram Gain, people would write questions. So what happened was um, that somebody wrote to him a letter so the Jews of Spain wrote him a letter and they said, listen, tell us the order of our davening. Now let's get back to that. Siddur, Tfila, the order of the davening. Because when people would be, would be davening, they didn't have a Siddur. There was, what, what was the purpose of the Chazan? The purpose of the Chazan was somebody who knew the Tfila well. And he would be the one to repeat it because you can't expect everyone did a good job the first time. That's why you have Chazara Sashatz. I'm going to go to a, a, a side note. And the side note is that um, the Rambam in his time, he abolished Chazara Sashatz, believe it or not. If you look into my Sefer, it's online. If you look into my Sefer, you could see over there the episode where people were talking so much during Chazar HaShatz. So he got up one day, he punched on the table. I don't know if he punched on the table, but he said, no more Chazar HaShatz. And that lasted for quite a while. It was only in his area. He didn't abolish it. You won't have to find the Mishnah Torah, any halacha that it's going to say, well, if you guys are talking, then don't do Chazar HaShatz. He didn't make it a halacha. However, he did for his specific area, and he said, no more Chazar HaShatz. The one who brought it back was, was the Radvaz. The Radvaz is the one who brought it back a couple of four, 400 years later, around 400, uh, 300 years later. He brought it back, and he was, just like the Rambam was, around 40 years in Mitzrayim, the Ramadvaz was also around 40 years. He wrote Shiloh Sotchuvis, over 3,000 of them. Unbelievable person. 
And of course, we'll be speaking about him also. So he decided in Mitzrayim, where he was a Rav, he's going to bring it back and therefore continue to have Chazar Sashat. Back to this. So what happened? The Jews of Spain, they wrote a letter to Rav Amram Goyen and they said, hey, could you please tell us what's the order of the tefillah? He wrote back the letter and it be, was called Seder Shal Rav Amram Goyen. Just like Seder Shal Pesach. This is the order that he said. Well, first you should dive in this, then you should dive in that. That was the first Seder. Why didn't they have the Seder before? Dvarm Shabal Pei, Yatir Biksav. Not so fast to have a Seder. The same thing also happened with Ripsad Yagain. Now, Ripsad Yagain is a name that we heard so much, and he is unbelievable, Ripsad Yagain. He was also different amongst the Ga'inim. As a side note, that Ripsad, all the Ga'inim came from Bavel. Bavel is today's Iraq. They all came from Bavel. Besides Ripsad Yagain, he came from Mitzrayim. And that was because he was so unique. So they pushed aside their pride and they took Reb Sadia Gain. So Reb Sadia Gain also wrote a Siddur and a Seder of Sadia Gain. And from that, we get the Siddur. So from that, we have all the different Nuschas and everything. So, so far, what do we learn? What's the reason for that? The Seder of Pesach was Baalpeh. Even what we daven is Baalpeh. And let's go to Mishnah Taira of, of the Rambam. So here, let me give you something here and open up a PDF. Okay. Anyone, anyone who wants this PDF, you, all you have to do is email me or WhatsApp me if you want. And basically what I did, I never printed it, but I wrote it safer on the Rambam called Amavi Lucifer Rambam. You could get it. You'll be able to get that also in PDF on my website, the Mirz Hashem, but you could get it from the Yeshiva website. Anyways, the second Sefer is Hakdama. The Rambam wrote Mishnah Torah and he wrote for a 14 Svarim. So the idea of this document basically is to give a synopsis, a mavai, an introduction to each sefer. So here in sefer, so you have Akdama Klolis, the, you have the uh, introduction, uh, general introduction, Psykli Psuke. The Rambam started every sefer with a Pusik, and we explain what's the connection of the Pusik. So I'm giving a little plug for this. If somebody wants to sponsor Printing of the book, I would appreciate it. Will help out a lot. Mikor is a safer seder mesuder is why it's written a particular order um, that he had. You have different halachas that the Rambam wrote. Here is seder mesuder. Why does it start hilchas carbon pesach? Then hilchas chagiga, hilchas bechayres. Then it goes to the next one and the next one. Some of them we glean from the Magid Mishnah talks about it. There's other mefarshim, hardly anyone talks about it. However, we had to do a lot of thinking ourselves, and this is at least B'derech Efsher, why it's a particular order. We know that the Rambam was very, very organized. So here we took different pninim from the Sefer, and we talked a little about that, but this is one thing that I wanted to discuss with you, and that is in connection with the idea of Baal Peh of learning something by heart. So you may find it surprising, even after all of us who've been learning Mishnah Torah for such a long time, but let me tell you a secret. The secret is, it's not gonna be so much of a secret now, that the Rambam, when he wrote the Mishnah Torah, he wanted that we should know it, Baal Peh. That was the reason for, that was the thing that he wrote, and we have many different pr proofs to that. Uh, for example, for example, um, the Rambam wanted to write it. By the way, I'm glad that I brought this up over here because I wrote this a while ago and I forget things. So the Mishnah, going back to the Mishnah, the Mishnah was written according to according to 
some people. Oh, Bali Taisvis. The Mishnah in Tiferes Yisrael. Tiferes Yisrael, if you see over here, that's a Pirish on the Mishnah. So it says, so he writes that the Mishnah was actually written with Nigina. Just like we have Tame Nigina, we have Trup for Chumash. So the Mishnah was also written with Trup, with, with notes, sing song. That's what he writes. And that goes back to what we originally said in the idea of Torah Shabbat in Rabbi Yudan Nasi. He didn't want to do a complete breakaway. He wanted to write notes, but even more so, he wanted to keep the Biksav of it and the Baal of it. And that is by writing notes to it. So you should be singing the Mishnah. You should know it. The Shalah also writes about it. Incredible. So back to the Rambam. So the Rambam, when he wrote, when he wrote in his Akdama for Sefer HaMitzvah, V'nir Elisha Toiv Tiech Lukasu Sheyusam Alochas Alochas, K'day She'yenekel Odasu Yisai Al Peh, L'mi She'yirtze O'yliskar Dovin Mimeno. The Rambam wanted us to know it by Baal Peh. V'chol Peh in Akdama, every chapter I'm going to divide L'hilchus Ketanis, K'day She'yiyu Siduran Al Peh. They should know, they should be known by heart. We mentioned before the Radvaz. How many chuvas did he did he write? I'm glad you know. I'm glad you're listening. Over 3,000. Shalas Chuvas Radvaz. Somebody asked him a question. They said, Why is it that the Rambam is telling us a certain thing? And he's saying, How many there are? Minyana limote mai. That's a Lushan in the Gemara. The minion, for what reason? Uladaiti, this is his answer. Uladaiti ain zushe, la bedivra rav klau, ki huz al chibra chibura kidesh, yomadu i say al pe. Ulazatam chilik i say prokim prokim alochis alochis va minion, mavoi godo vesimen, lishira velilma ya inian al pe. Varizet poshut maoidetsli. It was a poshut thing that the Rambam is writing different. Counts and the reason he writes the counts is because they're mavoi gadol v'simin l'schira to remember it. So that once again, I bring you this from from svarim v'seifrim. By the way, also we also speak about what is the connection from the last halacha to of the sefer to the next one. The next sefer is haschol is sefer tahara. So we write about the connection. This is how organized he was. Getting back over here, we'll spend a few more minutes and it's okay because um, if you wanna hang up, go ahead. I'm just looking at the screen right now. I have no idea what's going on in Zoom. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So he wrote over here that Mishnah Torah, Shal Rambam, Baal Peh, Amovai, and Sefer Karbanis, we cover that. Now, what about Shulchan Aruch of Rabbi Yosef Cairo? What about that? It's also Baal Peh. Now, I did a couple months ago, I was giving a shear. I give a shear, or I used to give a shear before this corona on Svarim Vesayvrim at the Free Synagogue in Chicago. That's a plug for Rabbi Levi Natik. And between Mincha and Mara, we go through different Rishonim, and we did the uh, Beis Yosef, the Ramon, everything, and uh, the Rush and the tour. So one thing that we said over there is when we're talking about Rabbi Yosef Cairo, so I mentioned, and I'm going to have to f- find it, uh, and uh, the tour. The Rabbi Yosef Cairo, I, th- I think I'm going to have to find it for next time. But... Rav Yosef Cairo wrote Beis Yosef, and then he wrote the Shulchan Aruch. So in Shulchan Aruch, let me 
see if I if I could find it. No, let me. Can, I'll I'll just tell you this now. If somebody else could, if someone could just email me uh, info at shazak.com, the source for what I'm going to say. The Shulchan Aruch, the Rabbi Yosef Kara wrote in his introduction. He printed. There's four halakim. There's four turim. He went after Rabbi Yaakov Balaturim. He went off after that organization. The organization is Ayrachayim, Yerdeya, Avin Ezer, and Chaysha Mishpat, four parts. In the introduction that Rabbi Yosef Cairo writes, and it's always good, and I implore you, look into the Akdamas of this farm, find out who wrote the Sefer, find out why they wrote the Sefer, find out what they wanted. It's so important. So in his introduction, he writes that I want everybody to learn Shulchan Aruch, Baal Peh. I want you to learn the whole Shulchan Aruch. At first I thought he meant only Arachayim, but I was wrong. He said, Arachayim, Yeradeya, Evan Ezer, Chayshem Mishpat, the whole Shulchan Aruch, Baal Peh. Now, that's a lot, but he did something also to accomplish this. So let's go over here at least see a picture of Shulchan Aruch, images, Shulchan Aruch, Shulchan Aruch. Whoa, to learn the whole thing about Peh, Shulchan Aruch, that's, that's impossible. Well, really not, because when the first printing of Shulchan Aruch, there wasn't, there was not many printings. There was not, there, there weren't any Mepharshim. So therefore it wasn't, if you look at the text itself, it's not that much. It's a lot more than Tehillim, but what? Rabbi Yosef Karo did, what he did was he also divided it up by days, just like we have that it's divided up by days. Our Tehillim, the same thing also is that he divided up by days. So therefore, in Adkan Yaim Aleph. He put in a certain section, ad, kan, yaim, phase, ad, kan, etc., etc., and yaim of aleph. Now, so I'm skipping to yaim of aleph for, for, per, for a purpose. The purpose is to tell you something what happened. Only in the first printing of Shulchan Aruch, did they actually write, put in something that Rabbi Yosef Karo set up on Kanye Malaf? And the printers decided, the printers did whatever they wanted. So they decided, okay, time to get rid of it. And they no longer had, uh, and they deleted Ad Khan. <laughs> they decided, it's only the first printing you have it. But look into the Hakdama, his introduction. He says clearly, I am writing the Shulchan Arach here. Let's bring this up. Um, opening up another document that I have, that we have, uh, this is not was not ready for print, but let's see if we could find this over here. So, so he wrote over there, he wrote over there, let's see if we could find it. Mm -hmm. Do I have it? Oh, I can't find it. I'm going to get it for you next time. Um, but he writes, but he writes over there that it, that was divided. Now, the printers took it away. The printers took it away. However, by mistake, and this is in Chelek Evan Ha'ezer, I forget which simon. By mistake, these words were left in Ad Khan Yaim Chaf Aleph. So if somebody could do the research and let me know which chalik of Evan Ezer it is. But what happened is the whole halacha got messed up. I think it has something to do with Pesach. And you could, you could understand the halacha. He's talking about different days. And he says, ah, I think they crossed out, if I'm not mistaken, they crossed out Khan and they wrote 
whatever it is, ad yaim chaf aleph. And that became incorporated in the halacha. So now you know how mistakes happen. Comes along the Sefer Mitzvah Meira Seinayim, who is the Sma. I don't know how you pronounce it. I think you pronounce it the Sma. Savior of Yeshua Folk. Rabbi Yeshua Folk. What do we do? English or Hebrew? Uh, we'll do the English. Rabbi Yeshua Folk, 1555 to 1614, who wrote a peerish, a major peerish on Chelek Evan Ezer. And he writes over there, you know what? You guys got it all wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. This has nothing to do with the halacha, which makes absolutely no sense. Look into the Sma. The Sma writes and brings down from his Akdama. And in his introduction, he says that Rabbi Yosef Karo, when he wrote Shochanar, he wanted us to know it Baal Peh. Once again, Dvarim Shebik Shabal Peh. Dvarim Shabal Peh, you don't write it down, but he wanted he wanted it should be Baal Peh. And therefore, what was really written over here was Ad Khan, and these printers took it away. Look it up in the Sma. With this, I'd like to conclude. Last night, I uh, saw something on YouTube, and it was a conversation between my very good friend, the Bala Mechaber, Ichi Kaduzi, Rav David Taub, and his brother, Rav Shays Taub. And it was a conversation. Rav Shays Taub said something so interesting. I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but here you have the Hayyayim Yayim. We talked about the Hayyayim Yayim before. And he said a vart, and I'd like to say that this actually has a connection to what we're talking about. We're talking about the difference between Baal Peh and why it's important that it remains Baal Peh. So one of the things we said is the difference between static and dynamic. Static means it stays still. So Rabbi Tao, Rabbi Shays Tao said interesting thing. If you look into Hayyim Yayim and you go to the introduction, the introduction, I never saw this before. I never uh, really paid attention to it. Luach Arzaruel Hasidei Chabad. I don't know if you see it. Luach Arzaruel Hasidei Chabad. So he has said, that you have divre taira, you have vertlach. There's no such thing as a as a vertel. There we go again. There's no such thing as a vertel in Chabad. It's what it is. It's a nekuda. What is a vertel? What's a dvar taira? Somebody comes along and says something really nice, and that's it. It's finished. It doesn't grow. It's finished. It's a nice thing. You got a good chap. Like I said, the chap before with the seder, is soy, drush, and remez, and not the pshat. That's a vertel. You're not going to grow with that. When the Rebbe put together hayayim yayim, the idea was, it could be just one line, two lines or something. It's a nakuda. It's a point that has to grow. It's just a starting point for your day. But you have to live with it the whole day. You have to grow with it. Ar zerua, it's a light that's planted. That's what the zariah is. If you have something in a sefer, and all it is is a sefer, I toiled, I put together a mavi le sefer, a rambam, and where is it? It's on a bookshelf somewhere. That's it. However, if you talk about it, if we do, let's say, this Zoom class on ha mavi le sefer, a rambam, we'd love to do that also, then it becomes dynamic. Then it's room to grow. And that's what the Torah is about, but really not so fast. And the next year, we'll continue with this idea and see the difference in Ashkafa between Sfard and Ashkenaz and how it affects everything that we have in our Torah, in our learning Gemara, in Halacha. By the way, one thing I did want to mention before that is just when we're talking about static versus dynamic. So what's the word halacha? Think about it. Halacha means going. You're going. You're, you're, you're moving. The opposite of static. 
So that's what ha- halacha is. It doesn't mean that halacha is changing, but it is changing in a way that, for, for example, the halacha in this one community is like this, and the different community is like this, or things change times that we have right now with coronavirus. What was a halacha? The halacha was before, and you're supposed to go to show. And now the halacha is that you're not supposed to go to show. And the halacha is all different things that we're doing. So that's halacha. We're going. That's what we have to go with. But it is something which is dynamic. Once again, if you have any questions, info at, shaza- at, at, info at shazak.com. Please ask me the questions. If you want anything, you have any special things that you want to do. I also do have a WhatsApp group. If you go on my... If you go on my website, which is zak.com, and I don't know if you see this, things look familiar over here, but the main thing is, please donate. No, I'm just joking. If you want to WhatsApp me, just press this button over here, shazak.com, and Parshas Emmer, press this button, and it should take you to a WhatsApp. Or if you want to join the WhatsApp group of Shazak, and then I could put you on Sfarim Vesayvrim. Just say you want to be on Sfarim Vesayvrim. And that's that. So I want to wish everyone a good Shabbos. And with this, we conclude. Everyone stay safe.